Okay, well, good morning, and uh, thank you, Ronnie, Leslie, and Brenda, at, and everybody else at the Small Business Development Center, and I am actually in Smithtown Library, and you can be too. Um, when I, I can take appointments um, most days of the week, please call ahead to make an appointment, as I wear a lot of hats here at the library. Uh, one of the things I do is I am the Patent and Trademark Resource Center representative. So, when it comes to patents and trademarks, who is the authority in the United States? Well, you might have guessed it. It's the United States Patent and Trademark Office. And uh, here, here you see the old building up in the upper right, but they have really swanky offices now in Alexandria, Virginia. I get to go there once a year for training. Uh, in this past pandemic year, it was virtual training, still was very helpful. And that's part of what the requirements are of being a patent and trademark resource center. So what exactly is a Patent and Trademark Resource Center? Well, the Patent Office, they thrive on the fees that people like you and me and corporations and businesses pay for applications to get a patent and the fees to maintain a patent. So it will behoove the Patent Office to get the word out there about what they do. And one of the ways that they get the word out there is they partner with libraries, mostly university libraries and then some public libraries like myself. And what we do is we get the word out there to people like you, everyday people, even professionals come and visit us. Sometimes you wake up and you have a brilliant idea and you ask yourself, well, what do I do next? What do I do with this idea? Well, one of the things you can do is come to a PTRC like us here in Smithtown. We're the only one on Long Island. And what I do is I help people understand what kinds of intellectual property protections available to them. And as I mentioned, we work with the USPTO. We are designated by the USPTO and accredited by them. You may have heard of us before. Uh, years ago, we used to go by PTDL, which stood for Patent and Trademark Depository Library. Well, thank goodness the depository part is kind of faded away. Now that everything's digital, uh, we don't have to have reams and reams of patents and trademarks sent to us every single uh, week. So we're able to thrive really well in our little corner here at the Smithtown Main Building at One North Country Road. Now, what, who comes to visit a patent and trademark resource center? Really all kinds of people. We have stay-at-home moms, we have doctors, we have professionals. I get a lot of contractors, probably because they're used to working with their hands. And we get a lot of students. And the main reason they like to come and visit with me is because I show them how to begin their preliminary patent search. Or if they have a mark, like a name, a symbol, a logo, or a combination of them that they want to use to represent their business, to distinguish their business from others, and they want to register it with a trademark office, they don't know where to begin. Well, I can show them how to begin what they call a clearance search before you spend the money to apply for a trademark. Do a little research. Make sure someone hasn't beaten you to the punch. I can provide that for you as well. For those who are a little more versed, well-versed with patents and trademarks, uh, even professionals, we have databases called Pub East and Pub West, stands for Public Examiner Assisted Search Tool. This is the kinds of tools that are used by the patent examiners themselves. So we have a few law firms in the area that like to visit quite a bit, so much so that they've actually donated monitors for our PTRC corner because they wanted to make look a look a little bit more like their own office because they were there so often. And I did mention that at one time, this was a depository pr uh, program and no longer, but the only thing that still gets deposited at libraries are what's called plant patents. And when you think of plant patents, it's exactly what you're thinking. Trees, shrubs, berries, fruits, roses. These kinds of patents uh, differenti differentiate from one each other very subtly. It could be the color, it could be the texture. For those reasons, the pictures have to be very accurate. While some of the pictures are available online, people's monitors differ from computer to computer. So they still issue the plant patents of the photos of the plants, the shrubs, the bushes, the berries and fruits in paper format. And that's the only thing that we still get in paper format. Those are only available at Patent and Trademark Resource Centers. There are 85 of them around the country. There are five in New York State. Smithtown Library is the only one in Long Island with them. And occasionally when things are better, we're not in a pandemic, we'll have some programming. As Ronnie mentioned earlier, we've had people from the USPTO office in Alexandria, Virginia themselves come up and offer some programming. So we're gonna be talking about something called intellectual property protection. Everyone's got property, the things in your pockets right now, you're protecting them. Uh, you're protecting your cash and credit cards in your wallet uh, at home and at work. You, you probably have a locker or something 
at home, I'm sure you lock your windows, your doors, you may even have a fence around your house. But what about intellectual property, property that comes from the mind? You can't really build a fence around your head uh, that look a little silly, but there are ways to protect your ideas. So to go over that, we're going to pretend that we are all in the umbrella business today. And this is our product, okay? With this little illustration will help us understand the differences between the different kinds of intellectual property protection that are available to us. So our umbrellas are really fantastic. We even hire a bunch of artists that give us these wonderful, wonderful artistic designs. And those artistic designs are gonna be protected by copyright. Copyright protects artistic works, your paintings, even your choreography, your song lyrics, screenplays, and such like that. It doesn't protect the ideas in the screenplay or novel or, or what have you, but it protects the artwork itself. Now, our, our umbrellas are very popular because they're really well made. So we have a brand name. So when you when we have shoppers go to the aisle in the, in the department store and they see racks and racks of umbrellas, they recognize the word fruits. And on the umbrella means that this is a company that makes really darn good umbrellas. So when I see fruits on an umbrella, I know I'm getting a quality product. Well, because we developed a good reputation and we have our own brand, we don't want anyone stealing our, our customers by coming up with a similar brand like fruity or fruitful umbrellas, that would be called, that would be infringing upon our good name. So to protect our logo, our brand, we use a trademark. So trademarks are names, logos, brands, and or combinations of that are used to identify the source of a product so that the consumer is not confused about who they're buying from. Now, our umbrellas are really special. They also have a brand new umbrella rack that's built especially strong to keep it from collapsing from really intense, intense weather. And that is a brand new rack that our engineers at our company invented. So to protect that new device, we protect that with a patent. So patents protect new devices, um, new processes, articles of manufacture, uh, those kinds of things are protected with a patent. But yet there's one more thing that we do we actually manufacture our very own uh, umbrellas in our very own factory. And I don't know if you can see the factory over here, but on the assembly line, my wonderful and talented engineers came up with a brand new machine that allows us to pump out our wonderful umbrellas cheaper, more efficiently and faster. But because that machine only exists in my factory, I don't wanna get a patent because patents expire. What I want to do is keep it a secret and tell no one and keep that as a trade secret. Trade secrets would be something that would be shared only with the people that need to know. And I would probably have them sign some kind of a contract if they were to maybe divulge my secret. I could fire them, perhaps sue them, but that's about as much as you can do. Trade secrets can be kept indefinitely like, like uh, Coca-Cola does and Kentucky Fried Chicken and WD-40. They can keep that so long as no one goes behind their back and steals their idea. But the good news is it doesn't expire. It just can be kept a secret for as long as they can keep it. So now we're going to delve a little deeper in the two types of intellectual property that I work with as a representative of the United States Patent and Trademark Office, starting with patents. So a patent, what you're getting, it's a grant, a property grant that gives you a legalized monopoly. And it should, because you and your team of inventors have spent a lot of research and development money. You did a lot of trial and error. And when you come up with that brand new product, why should you put it on the market and let the first person who buys it, you know, reverse engineer it and create the same thing? No, that's, that would be terrible. That would be a terrible incentive for inventors to keep inventing if their ideas are stolen. So what happens now is if you file for a patent and the patent is granted to you, you have exclusive rights stopping anyone from making, using, offering for sale, selling or importing your device in the United States and its territories. That's where you got what uh, a lot of inventors find out the hard way. A US patent will protect you in the United States and its territories. So if you come up with a great idea, it is patented with a US patent and you decide you're gonna go into business and you arrange to have 100,000 units mar uh, built for you in China or in Mexico, if that Mexican or Chinese manufacturer really likes your idea, 
he can make 200,000 units, sell you back the 100,000 units you ordered, and then go ahead and sell the rest to his countrymen. And that's fair because there's no such thing as an international patent. We just can't get all the countries in the world to get along. <laughs> go figure. But there is something called the PCT, Patent Cooperative Treaty. It's um, kind of working towards an international patent. It, the patent cooperative treaties, you can file your patent documents internationally, but you still have to apply to each region. Some areas of the world are protected by region, like European Patent Office has over 30 countries in them. Some are just country specific, like United States, Japanese, and Chinese Patent Office. There's something called a provisional patent application. This is a wonderful thing to have. What a provisional patent application, but I should probably start by explaining that we have a first to file system in the United States, meaning if Leslie and Ronnie and I are on different parts of the country and we're all thinking of a brand new mousetrap, it's the first one of us to, be fought to file a provisional patent application that articulates our idea well enough that we'll get that file date and then people who file after me would not be able to get that patent because I beat them. I was the first one to file. Now, the provisional patent application, it's kind of like a watered down patent. You don't have to include all of the things. It's not as, uh, as, as uh, time consuming. You don't have to include any claims or oath declarations. You don't have to include any prior art searching. Uh, it's a lot easier and cheaper. There are three pay scales and um, what everyone wants to qualify for is a micro entity status. Um, if you qualify as a micro entity status, you get a 75% discount on fees. Above that is a small entity status, which is reserved for nonprofits, universities, and some individuals. You get a 50% discount on fees. And then for your businesses and corporations out there, they pay the 100% of the fees. And if we get a chance later, I'll show you some of those fees. But getting back to the provisional patent application, which everybody wants to do. Once you file your provisional uh, patent, you have a year's time. It's a 12 month pendency for you to file your regular patent application. And you just bought yourself a whole year to find out whether this is really a good idea. Can I make this for a profit? Should I visit the SBDC and let them know what I'm getting involved in? And they can tell me if I get some seed money or if this is something that can, has really legs, can it really work? So you're talking business partners, fabricators, manufacturers, without the fear of them stealing your idea. And all the while you can use patent pending on your device, which you know, raises some eyebrows. People like to get new technology. Also, you can start to talk about your idea without the fear of someone stealing your idea. I can go up to Leslie and I, Leslie owns a manufacturing business. And I say, Leslie, I like this idea. What do you want to go in business with me? And Leslie will say, no, nah, I don't think so. Not for me. But then I find out that six months later, Leslie's trying to patent her own version of my idea. And I say, no, no, I had filed that first six months earlier. I have the earlier filing date. So that's a wonderful thing about a provisional patent application. Your idea doesn't have to be fully fleshed out. If your idea starts to evolve and you want to make changes, you can file another provisional patent application that includes your new changes. But those new changes will only take effect from that file date. Okay? And for most people who, uh, who qualify as a micro entity, it would only be a $75 fee to file that provisional patent application. And again, it, it starts a year's time before you file your regular patent application. Okay, different kinds of patents. We just discovered as a provisional patent application. Well, there's three different kinds of patents. 90% uh, of the time when people are talking about patents, they're talking about a utility patent, which is a new process, a new machine, a new article of manufacture. People often ask, what's an article of manufacture? Article of manufacture is like a pencil. There's no moving parts. It's not a machine. And then new, uh, new compositions of matter. Most inventions, most new patents are improvements upon existing patents existing articles like for instance you will still see patents for the pencil while the pencil was invented many hundred, hundred years ago people are still making improvements to it so you can't repatent something that has expired but you can patent improvements to the pencil for instance aspirin aspirin's been around for a very very long time but there was a farmer who discovered that by feeding the aspirin to their hogs the hogs would get fatter uh, quicker and ready for the market faster. So he was able to repatent aspirin for that purpose only, not for everything that aspirin does for us. Okay. So there's often a question, can I patent something that's been patented before? The answer is kind of, 
It just you have to have a new purpose for it. And as you see, the patent uh, number is just a series of numbers without anything preceding it. The next type is the design patent. I always think of Steve Jobs when I think of design patents. The design uh, patent just protects the ornamentation, the design of the device. Here we have the iPod with its rounded curves in here and rounded buttons. Steve Jobs had dozens of patents, but they were mostly design patents. Uh, he didn't design the inner workings of the iPod. He just decided, I want it to look like this. And then he has a patent on that look no one else can mimic. And as you see, design patents begin with a letter D. I mentioned earlier something called plant patents. Yes, once again, these are actually anything that can be, uh, any asexually reproduced distinct variety of plant can be patented. So if you're a farmer out there, if you've got your winery out there and you kind of crossbreed and come up with a, a, new, a new type of grape that just tastes fantastic in a Riesling, well, you might want to protect that new grape from anyone else you know, visiting your vineyard and plucking them off the, off the vine and, and starting to plant their own. So uh, I have very few people come and ask me about plant patents, but we have seen a upsurge in cannabis uh, patent, uh, plant patents coming in. So <laughs> good times to have, I suppose. <laughs> uh, plant patents, again, they are uh, pictures. They come in in hard copy pictures because there is a lot to do between the, um, the color and the texture. So some of the differences are so subtle that we, we, as in the USPTO, don't want everyone to make decisions about new plant varieties based on people's computer screens, because again, different computers uh, always have a little variation in color and contrast and the amount of pixels. So it's, if you're interested in the plant patents, the best thing to do is to visit a patent and trademark resource center. And there, again, there are 85 around the country. We do have a question, William. Sure. I don't know whether that's something you want to answer now. Leslie, did you see the question about car patents, which I think I could probably answer myself, but somebody asked the question about, can you patent our cars, design of cars patent? I'm sure they are. I couldn't tell you who has a design patent, but I'm sure that they are. Um, Me too. I mean, if you were to any vehicle on the road today, if you uh, were to dissect it, you could probably find dozens of patents. And if you look under your hood, you'll probably see patent numbers uh, in a, at least a few different places. Uh, the design of the cars, uh, since these are companies with deep pockets, they probably have patent teams and lawyers that will try to protect their designs. So. Um, without giving any specifics, I'm going to say that generally I would think that, yes, there are designs, uh, patents for car designs. All right. So let's say you get a patent. Well, what am I getting? Well, like I mentioned earlier, you're getting a legalized monopoly uh, for utility patents. It's 20 years and plant patents is 20 years. Design patents only last 15 years. And again, the inventor gets a legalized monopoly. No one can make, use, import, or sell their device in the United States and uh, its territories. But what does the government get? Well, when you file for a patent, you have to fully disclose how your patent is made and how it works. That becomes public domain. And the reason the government wants that is the government wants to stimulate innovation. They want people to see what you've created. Now, they're not going to let anyone recreate what you have done, but they want, you, they want the public to learn from your innovation because you stimulate innovation, then you stimulate the economy, and newer inventions may come from that. And again, the USPTO.gov is it's a little foreshadowing. We're going to wind up there a little later. <laughs> okay, so what do I need to do after I have a brilliant idea for a brand new patent? Well, to become patentable, uh, the biggest obstacle is that it has to be new, novel to the whole world. So before you file for a patent and lose that application money, you want to do a clearance search, a search to make sure no one has beaten you to it. Mind you, your search is going to be new, not just to the U.S. Patent Office, but the whole world. So how we do that search? Well, we, the first thing you want to do is go to the USPTO.gov website. And um, you also want to search just wherever you think your product will be sold. Websites, trade shows, um, if it's a very scientific invention, maybe scientific articles, because sometimes these inventions are not patented. And if it's not patented, it doesn't mean it still could be something that could uh, stop you from getting a patent. And when you file for a patent application, let's say for a mousetrap, it'll go to an expert on mousetraps. 
That patent examiner will know all the trade shows, trade magazines, websites, and patent offices. So you got you leave no stone unturned when you're doing a patent search. But for now, I'm going to focus on patent offices. So one particular patent office is the USPTO. The, um, the USPTO recommends that before you make an investment into your patent idea to search the big three patent offices in the world, United States, European patent office, and Japanese patent office. When I have clients come to the library and visit me for free, I show them a demonstration of how to do a search in the United States and the European and the Japanese patent office time. We have, we have time for that. Uh, in any case, what kind of search are we doing? We're going to do a, not a keyword search. And the reason we don't do a keyword search is because way back in 1970, before 1976, the patent office, they weren't too savvy about how there would be uh, search engines in the future, like Google and Bing, where you could put in a keyword and everything shows up right there. Um, patent documents before 1976 are not searchable by keyword. So what we do is a classification search. Classification is really helpful, especially here in the library. What it does is just brings like things together so that it's easier to browse. And the classification system that is used by the patent office is called the Cooperative Patent Classification System, which was actually spawned by the European Patent Office. So there's a quick demonstration of how we would use it, how uh, classifications can be used uh, to help sort information because the patent office gets thousands of different types of gizmos thrown in every year from new pencil sharpeners, new mouse traps, fuel cells, and rocket ships. How do you make all that information sortable and easy to search? Every invention gets pushed and prodded into a classification or times time, several classifications. So as you, the inventor, wants to see if anyone has beaten you, you to that technology, if there's any prior art, you want to find out what classification my invention would fall under, find that classification throw that classification into the database and get a listing of all previous inventions in the same category as mine and then comb through them to see if anyone has that idea already. So to do that, first we have to find the classification. So in the library, if I was to look up umbrellas, I would find that it belongs in the call number 391.4. And I simply go up to the shelves, the call number 391.4, and I find books on umbrellas. Kind of the same thing with the USPTO. It's a little different, but they have their classification system, the cooperative patent classification, and you find out where the umbrellas are. And this umbrella, what's particular about it is that it is specially built to withstand heavy winds and rain so it won't collapse. So while uh, the patent office, they're very proud of themselves because this past summer they issued their 10 million, their, no, I'm sorry, 11 millionth patent. Well, that's wonderful for them, I, as an inventor, I don't want to look through 11 million patents. I only care about our invention idea for that umbrella that has a special rack to withstand heavy wind and rain. So I want to find a specific classification. And here, I think I found it. Devices for increasing the resistance of umbrellas to wind. And the classification is A45B25-22. Okay, so this is going, this is a little too easy simply because I'm trying to make it so, so we can show you a quick demonstration. Uh, do not be frustrated if you have a harder time finding your classifications. When you come visit with me, I give you a better demonstration about how to find those classifications. So that foreshadowing has finally paid off. USPTO.gov is the website where we're gonna do our searching. Is everyone still with me? Yeah, okay. So if you haven't been there before, the website it, it's looking a lot better than it used to. It's not quite as complicated. We're going to focus on this find it fast section over here, and we're going to do a quick patent search. And we have a patent classification number, so that's going to help us. When I hover over patents, the first item on my dropdown is patent search. Hey, holy cow, that's exactly what I want. Perfect. Well, it's not so perfect because here I have two databases. There's a PAT FT, then there's an app FT. Well, the PAT FT, that's the database that I mentioned earlier, has 11 million patents. This goes back to 1790 when George Washington started the patent office. It's a huge patent, uh, it's a huge database, but that's not so bad. What's scary is the app FT. App FT stands for applications full text. When someone files for a patent application, their application remains in the dark for 18 months. And after the 18 month period, it gets published for other inventors to see. So there's an 18 month blackout window where you don't know what's coming out the other side. So it is always gonna be a leap of faith 
no one can guarantee you a patent because you don't know if someone's three months ahead of you, six months ahead of you, or 14 months ahead of you. There's just, you're gonna have to ha take a leap of faith with your idea. So let's click into the PAT FT. And this is what our search looks like. Well, here in term one, the only thing I really have is my classification A45B25 slash 22, no spaces. In this field, I tell the database where to look for that number. And as I mentioned earlier, we're gonna perform a current CPC classification. The database template, it's defaulted to 1976, but we know that it does not perform searches before 1976 for anything. So we wanna select 1790 to present, even though something may have been patented in 1792, if it's the same thing that we're trying to patent, then it'll have beaten, we would, it, would, it would count as prior art and we wouldn't be able to repatent it. So when I click on search, it's gonna force the database to look for those, that classification that has to do with devices for making umbrellas wind resistant from 1790 to present. So when I click on search, I get 216 patents, not too bad. Well, this is the part where you have to do your due diligence and roll up your sleeves and look at each one of these patents. So let's take a look at the first one. Let's try, let's try this one. If you haven't seen a patent application before, this is what it looks like here. Um, the first thing I like to look at is the abstract because the abstract is a quick summary of what the invention is. Following that, you have your inventor information. And then you have something called Believe it or not, the patent office refers to that as an assignee. I guess they have a sense of humor. Uh, it looks like a signee to me, but basically what it is, this is the owner of the patent, the Shedring Corporation. Why is there a difference between the inventor and the owner? Well, Mr. David Haythright could be licensing his patent, which is really the dream. You come up with the idea and then you license it to someone and they build and advertise and manufacture and deliver it for you and you get a nice royalty. Or he may have sold his invention, his patent to the Shedrain Corporation. A little further along, we have the classifications that are being used. Here's our A45B slash 22, but there are some others as well. So if I'm doing my search and I keep coming across these other classifications, I'm gonna be saying to myself, well, hey, maybe I should be looking in there too. This references cited section is when this inventor did his search, Mr. Haythorn weight. He did a prior art search before his application and he found these like three dozen patents that were similar to his, but does not deny him his claims. And guess what? If I feel my invention is close to Mr. Haythorn weight's invention and Mr. Haythorn weight felt that these inventions were similar to his, well, guess what? Now I have to look at those too, even though it goes back to 1898. So I click on the patent number. Before 1976, there's no HTML. So I'm forced to go up to this link that reads images. I click on the image and I get to look at a picture of the patent from 1898. And sometimes, you know the expression, a picture says a thousand words. A, a really big shortcut that myself and a lot of other inventors like to do is simply go straight to the pictures because the picture may tell me all I need to know. And that's a more efficient way of going through all the results. All righty. Okay, so let me see if I can get to my toolbar up here. All righty. So that was a, just a very quick demo. Um, when you come visit with me, I sit with you for about an hour's time and it, it, I flesh it out much more for people who are visiting. But uh, for now, I'm going to switch to trademarks. Trademarks. Okay, so let's say you have a business or you intend to start a business. A trademark, again, is any word, phrase, symbol, or design or combination that helps customers to identify who is making that product. Now, you may have already seen symbols like the TM and the SM on products. Those are free to use. And a little later, I'll tell you, I'll explain exactly why. When, if you have a business and you intend to someday file your mark with the trademark office to register it, um, while, all, all along the way, you can use the TM and the SM right alongside your name or logo or symbol to start warning others in your industry that you're interested in protecting that trademark. 
Now the TM stands for trademark and the SM stands for service marks. Service marks are intangible goods, like let's say a lawn cutting service or lawyers or things you can't touch, just services. But they both kind of use the same umbrella term trademarks is what they're referred to. Now the TM and the SM are all well and good for your mom and pops or startups, but eventually what you want to do to prevent anyone from infringing upon your good reputation by using your name, logo, symbol is you want to secure yourself a registered trademark. So once you are registered and only before, uh, once you are registered, can you use the R that's encircled and that indicates that you have rights and that anyone who uses that trademark would be infringing upon those rights. So like I mentioned earlier, there's different levels of trademark protection. And the first two levels are common law. Common law would be considered like your mom and pop stores, your startups, uh, young young uh, businessmen and women who maybe don't are not aware of intellectual property protection, but they still have rights. If they use a logo or symbol or name first in that industry, they have rights to it. They may not know it, but they do have rights to it. Now, then there's state level registrations. State level registrations, let's say you have a food truck and things are going well, you have five, six food trucks and they're all over Long Island and Brooklyn and Queens. Well, you can get, if you're just doing commerce in New York state, you can secure yourself a New York state trademark. Um, it's cheaper. I think the last time I checked, it's $50. They don't have a database for searching, but they'll just do the search for you. And keep in mind, it's different than your business name. Business names and trademarks can be very different. You could be called, you could have a business like Procter & Gamble and that's their business name, but Procter & Gamble also owns like Old Spice, Ivory, uh, Dove. Those are all trademarks within Procter & Gamble's uh, host and library of trademarks. Um, so if, you're, if you have an online uh, website, an online presence, then you're probably going to be doing business inter uh, across state lines. So once you're doing business across state lines, the best type of protection you can get is a federal trademark protection. It is going to be more expensive. Um, you have two options when filing a trademark protection. And when it comes to trademark protection, it's uh, not as complicated as filing for a patent application. This is more something that might be more within the scope of someone who's had no experience with this, but is willing to put in the time and the effort. That it's something that they can certainly... Um, probably wrap their minds around. And I never discourage anyone from hiring an attorney, but I always think it's a good idea. And I've, I've seen this dozens of times. People come in, they do their own searching, and they discover that their patent has already been uh, out there, which is bittersweet. Um, a, it was a good idea because someone else came up with it as well. But B, they didn't have to pay hundreds, if not thousands of dollars to find out from someone else that it has already been taken. So I always encourage people to start off on their own doing their own searching and they'll become better clients if they do decide to hire a, an attorney. Um, and if they discover that their idea is already out there, they can learn to tweak around it or stop that idea and move on to the next. Uh, so there's two prices, 350 for T's. T stands for Trademark Electronic Application System and 250 for T's Plus. The difference between, not only is the difference $100, but T's Plus is cheaper because you have to be a little more exacting. You have to do a little more work. Um, when you apply for T's Plus. And there's no penalties for screwing up. If you screw up with your T's Plus application, they just bump you to the T standard and it's going to be a $350 fee. Okay. Um, you have a presumption of ownership nationwide. Trademarks will last indefinitely so long as what they call you're in commerce. So if you start off making tennis hats and then you start making tennis shoes and, ten and wristbands, and you stop making tennis hats because your shoes and wristbands are doing better, you can't use your trademark in the wristbands and shoes until you file for a trademark protection because they may be in a different international class. And I'll get into international classes later. Uh, so if you are no longer in business, you can't keep that trademark. You have to be in commerce to keep that trademark. But if you're in, in commerce, uh, you can keep that trademark for as long as you keep making the payments every 10 years. Um, you're Trademark can be deposited with the U.S. Customs Office. So if they see any fakes and forgeries coming into the country of your product, they'll be able to put a stop to that. And finally, you can put the encircled R on your product once you have a registered trademark. So what happens when you file for a trademark application? The attorneys, and they are attorneys on the trademark end of things, they're looking for something called SAM, which stands for Sound, Appearance, and Meaning. Um, in order to deny a trademark, it has to um, fail two tests. 
The first test is the SAM test. If your trademark sounds, appears, or means the same thing as an existing trademark or a pending trademark, they're going to deny it. For instance, there's the toothpaste Crest everyone's ever heard of. Well, another toothpaste company came out and then tried to call themselves Crescent. Well, that fails because it sounds and it appears too much like Crest. So that was a no-no. And then the other thing you want to do is to fail, you have to not only sound, appear, or mean the same thing as an existing mark, you have to be in the same industry. So if you're both, if so, if you sound like in a previous mark and you're in the same industry, most likely you're not going to have, have that trademark approved. So it seems to me like if everyone got their own trademark, we would for a certain word, and that word would be protected across all industries and all services, we would run out of words to trademark. So what we have is, is called, to, that helps us to, to distinguish different corporations, we have something called the identification manual or the acceptable goods and services manual. So what happened was all the big countries and governments of the world got together in Nice, France, and they hammered out international classes. They took all the goods and services that can be sold and hammered them into 45 international classes. And what that does, it allows two companies to have the same name, like Dove, who have the same symbol, a dove flying in air, and they get along famously. Why? Because no one's going to take a piece of soap and bite into it and think they're eating chocolate. These two companies have nothing to do with one another. They're in two inter different international classes. So because they're in two different international classes, they can coexist nicely without having to worry about infringing on each other's rights. So one of the things I show people to do when they visit with me is show them which international class they might fall under. Because if you come in with, let's say, Tiger uh, watches, you have a watch company called Tiger. Well, you don't really care about Tiger tires or Tiger produce. You just worried about others that are making wrist watches that call themselves Tiger. Okay. So the strongest kind of a mark, uh, a trademark would be a word mark. Like, can you hear me now? Good, bubblicious. These words are protected no matter how they're stylized. It could be bubble letters, block letters, graffiti letters, no matter how they're stylized, the, this string of words are protected. So the word marks are the strongest kind of a trademark that you can get. But there are others. You can just have a symbol. Um, you, I'm sure you all recognize these. Then it can get even more complicated with composite marks that have both words and symbols on them. And the trademark office is really branching out there. There's some rare marks out there like the color brown for UPS for delivery vehicles. They can actually trademark that color. Uh, Pizza Hut has trademarked their roof so that uh, no one else shows up to get pizza at a similar looking roof without knowing that it's Pizza Hut. And there's actually sensory marks now, sound marks. Now, I can't have you raise your hands, but uh, I used to play this when I would visit schools and see if they could recognize them, but you have to play at home, see if you can recognize these sound marks. And that was too easy. Aflac, but the second one. When you, when you hear that, you know it's going to be a good movie, MGM Lions. We're not hearing this. I don't, I'm not anyway. No one's hearing it? Oh, Are no. you less? I don't think so. No? Okay. No, there's no, no I can't hear anything. The demo's yeah, I don't got know why. That's too bad. This is my, my, my big closer. <laughs> yeah, huh. But, but in any case, um, if you want to uh, contact me, I'd be happy to show you or send you links on how to, how to listen to it. Um, but yeah, you can now um, trademark uh, sounds like that. Uh, NBC Chimes. Is another one. Um, Harley Davidson. Uh, probably Harley Davidson. No, it um, is. I've oh, it is? Heard. Okay. Um, Jolly Green Giant. So my advice to you out there is if you get a chance to visit, you have an idea for a mark that you want to uh, trademark, I'd be more than happy to show you a free demonstration. I can't give legal or business advice. So I show you by example, and you can, and you can apply what I've shown you to your own. Um, if you have an invention idea, you don't know where to begin, come by and see me. I'll show you the beginnings of the preliminary patent search. Um, I have lots of handouts for some great resources in the area, but you have to practice, practice, practice. Um, it's not easy. It's not meant for you to be able to, to do. Uh, but what I mean by practice, practice, practice is 
uh, you should get yourself a My USPTO account right away. Uh, My USPTO accounts are free. And once you have, if you're going to do business with the USPTO, you're going to need a My USPTO account. So to get a My USPTO account, here we are back at the PTO at the USPTO website. So what you want to do is go up here to the top right, and here is the link for the My USPTO account. All you really need is an email address. So you would click on create an account, and after you've created the account, you would be able to go through all the steps of filing a trademark all the way up to the very last part before you submit and pay. But that'd be great practice to see what's ahead of you, to get the idea of how it works. And you can do the same thing for patents. Um, the patent office is now offering what's called patent center over here. It's a beta program, but it's gonna be the new way people can file for their patent applications. So for instance, here we are in patent center here. And if you're interested in new submission, a new patent submission, you click here, you decide if you want a utility patent, a utility provisional, which is again, just time stamping when you start, you click on utility provisional. Start off with what's called a web ADS form, which is basically just biographical information about you. You put in the inventor's names, so forth and so on. They put in the represent any representatives, any foreign representatives, applicants, and you go forth and so forth and so on. But the nice thing is that with Patent Center beta, you get to actually see the whole entire patent application system without um, without having to actually apply for anything. And my favorite thing about patent beta, patent center beta, is they now allow you to file um, a good portion of your patent application using uh, Microsoft Word, as long as it's docx file. Now, the reason that's important is they have, um, just like Word has a spell check and a grammar check, well, if you use docx documents in Microsoft Word, it will actually, and when you submit it, it'll actually do a check to make sure that your format is correct. Then make sure that you're numbering your paragraphs, make sure that you have page numbers because the patent office, they're very exacting about how they want their application submitted. So it can be very easy and to, to, do, to file things incorrectly. And if you do that with a PDF form, well, you might have to start working with the uh, patent examiner will send you some office actions about this was entered incorrectly, this has to be done again. But if you file a docx format, you're gonna get that wonderful tool that does all the correcting, gives you all the suggestions for correcting ahead of time. And then you can file your patent application correctly and save yourself a lot of heartache and headache from having to get all those office actions from the USPTO.